Lesson 3-9. So what's on task for us today was we're going to learn about the inverses of sine, cosine, and tangent. So we've been talking a lot about sine and cotangent, excuse me, sine and cosine. We've been doing sine and cosine all the way from lesson 3-1 up and through 3-7. In last class, we introduced tangent in more detail. Today, we're going to start looking at the inverses, how to undo a function. So remember, inverse means to switch x and y. Now, the key here today, when we go over this, I want to get right out the start. I don't want to accidentally forget or anything like that. All trigonometric functions have a restricted domain. That means these will not be all real values. We are only going to be getting values on a certain interval. So our interval will be smaller than all reals. It will not be all reals. And we're going to go over that as we move forward. So starting here. Let's talk about inverse sine. Uh, inverse sine. To find inverse sine, what we do mathematically is you switch what's normally x and y, meaning I switch my input and my output. Well, with trig, what's weird is that the input is the angle, and the output on a triangle would be the side length, or in a circle would be either the horizontal, vertical displacement. Uh, or the slope of the line. So what am I trying to say? Let's look at this sine function right here. Question for you. This is the sine. Does this pass the vertical line test? Yes. Yeah, that means sine itself is a function. If you remember in lesson 2.8, in 2.8, we talked about the horizontal line test. And we said we can determine if the inverse is a function based off if it passes the horizontal line test. Does this pass the horizontal line test? No. So its inverse would not be a function. All right. So it does not pass the horizontal line test. So what we have to do to make the inverse be a function is we have to restrict the graph. That means we're going to cut off part of the graph. So look from image one to image two. What's the difference between these two graphs of sine? Cut off negative pi over two and pi two. We cut it off the graph at a domain value of negative pi over two or an interval from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. We cut off that part of the graph. Now, let me ask a question about this. Does this restricted graph of sine, does it pass the vertical line test? Yes. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Yes. So we'd say now sine is one to one, which means its inverse would also be a function. That's what all of this is telling you up top. Here's what I want you to draw attention to. Here's our interval for sine. And, uh, for sine. That's going to be our interval that we'll use with uh, the restricted sine. So it's marked a few places. Just draw attention to that. That's the restriction we're going to look at. And in a little while, I'll tell you how to kind of memorize that easier. For the inverse, this will no longer be the domain. For an inverse, remember, you switch your x's and y's, meaning you switch your inputs and your outputs. So this will become the range. Notice that becomes the range on the inverse from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So what does that mean my inputs will be? Well, how low, what is the original range here? How low does this go? Negative 1. And how high? One. So for the inverse, that becomes our restricted domain from negative 1 to positive 1. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's go on to the next slide, and we're going to find some values. So here it says, remember that theta equals sine inverse of x means x equals sine theta. Okay, what did I do here? Inverse. When I This started as an inverse. When I took away the inverse, what changed on the problem? The x got removed from the sine inverse function and became isolated, but the sine inverse became a sine with the theta. We switch the input and the output. We exchange those when we completed the inverse. Well, actually, when we undid the un inverse. So we're going to look at some values, and we're going to see what they represent in sine. Now, right now, I'm going to do the normal sine function. No, notice, this does not say sine inverse. This just says sine. So let's use our hand trick and find the values like we would have before. We're starting with negative pi over 2. On your hand trick, which finger represents uh, negative pi over 2? Your thumb. Uh, before I do this, I'm going to do one more thing. Draw a quick circle on your pa paper. A y-axis, an x-axis.
when you're at negative pi over two, you're starting down here. I want you to see this visually. We're gonna go from negative pi over two up to positive pi over two. We're gonna move all the way around until we get to positive pi over two up there. Let me do that so we can see it better. Okay, so now you told me to use your thumb. So bend your thumb, flip your hand over. What? How many Y fingers do you have after you flip your hand over? How many fingers above the bend? Four. Put the square root of four. And if you remember, for sine and cosine, we always divide by two. two. Now, here's why I drew, have the, you draw this. Negative pi over two is down here. Does this make a, a positive or a negative value? Mm, negative. That needs to be a negative because we're down low. That's negative. Now what we're going to do is rotate around, and we're going to move, starting from the negative y-axis, we're going to move around the circle this direction today as we go around our unit circle. So now I'm going to negative pi over 3. Let's just, just say it's like right there. We're going to reduce these at, at the very end. Okay, so now negative pi over 3. Which finger would you use for that? Okay. Index. Bend your index. Flip it over. How many y fingers do you have? So square root of 3 over 2. And a reminder, is this positive or negative? Negative. Negative because we're down low. Sign is y. Sign deals with the y. Okay, next spot. Negative pi over four, which finger would you use for that? Middle, bend your middle finger, flip your hand over. What do you now have? Two, two Y fingers, so this is negative square root of two over two. Have you figured out what the pattern, what's happening right now? It's decreasing. It seems like decreasing, but because it's becoming less and less negative, it's actually increasing. increasing. So what's the next value gonna be? Negative square root one over Two, what would the next one be? Square root zero over two. I'm gonna write them all unreduced first and then we'll reduce them later because unreduced, you can see the pattern. What would the next one be? We continue to increase. So right now, uh, if I put this dot on, uh, this dot we've moved to, th that's where zero is. So now I'm moving up this way. Now I'm positive numbers. Where am I now? Square root of one over two followed by Square root two over two, followed by, and finally, where do we end? Square root four over two. Okay, now let's simplify all these. What is the square root of four? Two, and so negative two divided by two would be negative one. This second does not reduce, so it stays. Uh, negative square root two over two does not reduce, it stays. But negative square root 1 over 2 can be reduced. How can I rewrite that? Negative 1 half, good. Square root 0 over 2 can reduce. What's that become? 0. Square root 1 over 2. 1 half. This stays, this stays. Finally, square root of 4 divided by 2. That's going to equal 1. Now, these are all the values for the inverse sine function, meaning on a sine function, there are more values. We could go around infinitely many times around the unit circle. We could keep going and going and going. But for a inverse sine, you will only go from negative pi over 2 to positive pi over 2 because it would no longer be a function if you keep on going. You know what? I want to show you this visually just to make sure you're understanding what I'm saying. Here is the sine function. That's uh, not... Here is the sine function. So I'm just showing you this real briefly to make sure you're tracking with what, why we're doing what we're doing. The sine function is trig sine x, enter. That's what sine looks like. Now, is that a function itself? Yes. Does this pass the vertical line test? Yes. Okay, does it pass the horizontal line test? Jocelyn, you still with me? Okay, does not pass the horizontal, which means if I just did the inverse of this, uh, I'm going to type in a code here to find the inverse. I'm going to go menu, graph entry, relation. And if I type in x equals, what I'm going to do, tell the calculator, is to switch the x and y's. If I type in x equals f1 of y, what this does is it plugs the y values into the function f, which is sine, 
and that sets it equal to the X values. It just switches the X and Y. That's all it does. There's the inverse. Now, does that pass the vertical line test? No. So what I was saying earlier is we need to restrict the graph so that this could pass the vertical line test. And so how you do a restriction on my calculator, if, if you ever need it, you hit control equals. And in here with all the inequalities, there's one that does not seem to belong. Which one does not seem to belong? Line. This line. If you click that, you're telling the calculator, calculator to restrict. We want to restrict from negative pi over 2, negative pi over 2, being less than or equal to x, which is less than or equal to positive pi over 2. And so now this is going to cut the blue graph. And consequently, because it cuts the blue graph, the red graph will get cut as well. And so there's my graph we're looking at. Now, why do I say that table will only be that long? Because we don't have any other values. What we just listed are all the special right triangle values along this line. We could find some within those point, those, that interval, like meaning we could find radians that are in between, but you cannot find any that are beyond pi over two or less than negative pi over two. They must be, all values must be within that. So that's pretty complete of a list for our inverse sine values. Okay, that's a pretty complete list. Now, what I want you to do is practice doing the inverse. How do we do that? I want you to use this table. And this time, I'm going to give you inverse values. And I want you to look on the table to see what you think the answer would be. Now, remember, what's different with inverse as opposed to a regular function is you switch the... So if this was the regular sign, these are your x's, these are your inputs, these are the outputs the y's so what's happening on inverse is i'm switching it so is this one a theta or a sine theta Theta. Sorry. it's a sine theta you need to find i'll just show you the math one time this is basically i'm going to do it one time and then we'll let you do the others this is saying that's basically equal to theta so if i wanted to get rid of that what would i do what's the opposite of a sine inverse a regular sine this is the same thing as one equals sine theta. You find where your sine theta box would equal one. Find where sine theta is represented by one and give me the theta or what that theta would be. So you're gonna find, you're gonna look on your table and say, okay, where did my sine theta have a value of one? Once you find it, the answer is gonna be whatever the theta value that would produce it would be. Okay, does that make sense? I want you to do all four of those. DOL number one. All right, now let's move on to inverse cosine. So inverse cosine is going to be very similar, except now I want you to notice we have a different restricted domain. We're not restricting from zero, excuse me, negative pi over two to pi over two. We're now restricting from zero to pi. Let me show you why. Let's look at this picture down here. Look at your picture. Does the original cosine, the actual cosine graph, does it pass the vertical line test? Yes. Does it pass the horizontal line test? No. So to make an inverse, I'd have to restrict the domain. So you want to restrict it to where it passes the, ver uh, the horizontal line test. Now, here's negative pi over 2 right here. That's negative pi over 2. This is positive pi over 2. If I restrict it the same way, would that part pass the horizontal line test? No, it doesn't work. So we're looking for the first interval that would pass. You could do it this way, but mathematicians don't go from a negative pi to zero. What they decide to do is positive zero, not positive zero, I'm sorry, zero to positive pi. That's where we restrict our graph. So it's going to go from zero to pi. Notice again, what's our minimum output for the cosine? What's our minimum output? Negative one. What's our maximum output? one, which means for the inverse cosine, it's going to go a domain of one to negative one. I said that backwards, a domain of negative one to zero. So uh, same output, whoops, on where they write this. Well, I don't see where I'm looking at. Well, here's, here's what's going to be for the inverse. This will be our input. No, this is right. Sorry. Here we go. That's going to be our output from 0 to pi. 
That's the restricted domain from the cosine becomes the restricted range. Our restricted domain for the inverse is negative one to one. Our restricted output is zero to pi. And that's the values for cosine. Now there's a way to remember this. You know what, I'm gonna hit the tangent and then I'll tell you how to remember it, okay? Once we hit tangent, I'll then tell you how to remember it. All right, first, let's fill out our table. So remember that theta equals cosine inverse of x means that x would equal cosine theta with this restriction. So we're gonna complete our table. One more time, what I want you to do here is to draw a unit circle. On our unit circle, we're only going to use the values from 0 to 1 pi, which means this part's going to get restricted. I, I wish I would remember to write that earlier. This part's going to get restricted out of there when you do inverse of cosine. So this part of the graph is going to be restricted. Now, what'd you ask? The negative y's are restricted, that's correct. And I'll, after we do tangent, I'll give you a way to kind of remember what gets restricted. Okay, so now looking at this table, let's start finding our values. So hand trick again, we're looking at the palm of our hand. What represents zero on the palm of our hand? Pinky, because there's no denominator. Bend your pinky, flip your hand over. How many cosine fingers do you have there? Four. So it's the square root of four divided by two. And if you look on your unit circle, it's a positive x because we're on the right side. So we're going to move from right to left. So we're going to start positive and it's going to become more and more negative as we go. Or it's going to be coming, it's going to decrease as we go, I should say. All right. What about the next value? What's pi over six? Which one's our pi over six finger? Looking at the palm of my hand again. Ring finger, bend your ring, flip your hand. How many X fingers do you have there? So it's the square root of three divided by two. Do we see the pattern? What's our next value gonna be? Square root of two over two, followed by square root one over two, that'll reduce all right to the left, followed by square root of zero over two. At pi over two, we're at this the Y axis. Whoops, I won't let me move that one. Uh, we're at the y-axis, so we're now at zero. And now we're gonna begin our negative descent. So what comes after square root of zero over two? Okay, and then, very good, followed by, and the next one we'll reduce, so I'll write it to the side, negative square root four over two. That's the pattern. Now we'll reduce all the way down. Square root of four over two can reduce to become one, this second does not reduce. A square root of three over two does not reduce, nor does a square root of two over two. But square root of one over two does. That reduces to become one half. Square root of zero over two reduces to become zero. This reduces to become, these two stay the same. This one becomes negative one. There we go. Okay, just like your first DOL round, I'm giving you a second DOL round. I want you to use that table. So this we completed was the regular cosine function just restricted from zero to pi. Now I want you to determine what would be the inverse values using that table. So use your table to complete uh, DOL number two. Find your values using that table, DOL number two. All right, now let's take a look at tangent. So with tangent, we basically have the same instructions up the top end. Here's what I want you to gather is your restriction. Make sure you make a note of this until we get the restrictions down. Make a note of this. And you might notice that tangent cannot be equal to the pi over twos. That's because that's where there, we have a vertical asymptote. I'm about to show you in the graph. So it's, it's like sine from negative pi over two to positive pi over two, but where it's different than sine is it's not equal to those values. All right, so here we go. It says the inverse tangent function 
using this sim, uh, this is the symbols you'd use, is the inverse of the restricted tangent function from here to here. I have a problem there, is that tangent does not exist. I, whoops, scribble those out. That should not be there. It should not be equal to. Because on a normal tangent graph, without a transformation, every pi over two, so one pi over two, negative one pi over two, three pi over two, every pi over two is a vertical asymptote. What we're gonna do is we're gonna cut off the, we're gonna restrict the graph. So we're only looking within a, a set of asymptotes. So notice they cut it off to here. And so we're gonna look within these two asymptotes and that's why it should just be a less than and a less than. So that means for the inverse tangent, the outputs are gonna become this negative pi over two and positive pi over two. I'm gonna go ahead and write that in so you can see that. That is negative pi over two here because this x-axis doesn't show. This over here is positive pi over two. On the inverse, that's going to become the output. All the values will be between the range, I should say. It's gonna be the range between negative pi over two and positive pi over two. Whereas the domain is gonna go from negative infinity to positive infinity, because this graph does the same thing. It, the range here goes down to negative infinity and as high as positive infinity. So that's what the domains, the domain will be all reals for the inverse tangent. I'll say it again, the domain for inverse tangent is all reals. However, the range will be restricted from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So let's fill out tangents table. Okay, first thing before we start filling out this table, go underneath again, draw yourself a unit circle. And I want you to restrict this left side of the graph. Now, the reason we restrict the left side, uh, this is the part that I was telling you is coming. The, the way it works is tangent, tangent itself by identity is equal to the y divided by the x's. If you have a variable X or Y in the denominator, you restrict where the denominator would be negative. That means we're gonna deal only with positive Y's. If we only deal with positive Y's, we won't have to worry about an asymptote. I'm gonna say that again. The way you get an asymptote in math is you're not allowed to divide by zero. So how I get a zero is dividing by X of zero. How do I get around that to not deal with asymptote is I'm gonna pick the values between negative pi over two and positive pi over two without actually reaching those values. That way, I don't deal with that asymptote. So I'm gonna avoid when X is zero, X is zero at these two spots. So if anything, I would need to do open circles there because we'll never actually reach those points, but we'll go around the circle this way without ever attaining those open circles. Now for the case of like sine or cosine, I'm gonna go ahead and just do this all at once. Sine, if you remember, by uh, identity is y over r. Since it's missing an x, we don't deal with negative x's. You have to have positive y's, you have to have negative y's, but we don't have to have negative x's since I don't deal with it. And so sine would also restrict from over here since x is not there. That would be sine's restriction. Cosine, on the other hand, cosine is different. Cosine, its identity is x over r. Well, to find all the values, I have to have positive x's, I have to have negative x's, but since y is not a part of its ratio, I don't have to deal with the negative y's. I can just deal with positive y's and be fine. And so we restrict where you have it a negative y. That's where y is less than zero. That's where you restrict. And over here, you would restrict when x is less than zero. So that's how it works. If you have a denominator, you restrict where the denominator is less than zero. If you have a denominator of X or Y. If you have a denominator of R, then you restrict by whatever letter is missing. That's how the restrictions work. I'm gonna be pounding that into your brain the next few months so that you remember that by the time May comes around, but that's how they work. Okay, we've done all of that. Let's fill in our table.
Tangent at negative pi over two. Take your hand. Pi negative pi over two, which would be which finger? Thumb. Thumb. Bend your thumb. Flip your hand over. How many y? Remember, tangent is y over x. How many y fingers do you have? Four. Square root four. How many x fingers do you have? Four. Square root zero. Okay, go to the next one. Oh, this will be negative. Should have included a negative there. Let me sneak that in. This is negative because we're starting down here at negative pi over two. And working our way up to positive pi over two. Okay, now let's go negative pi over three. Which finger is that? Index. index. Bend your index, flip your hand over. How many y's do you have? Three. Again, we're negative here. It's a negative y, so it's a negative square root three over one positive one x. Okay, here's the pattern. What's happening to my y's? Increase, increasing. They look like they're decreasing. Technically, they are increasing because they're working their way more positive. What's happening to my x's? Increase. They're also increasing. By the way, everything on tangent will always reduce. So make sure you're writing on the left side of the box. Everything will reduce. So what's the next y value? One. Negative square root one. What's the next x value? Three. Square root three. So then we have square root zero over one. four. Whoops, forgot the square root four. And now I'll have a square root one. X, uh, y's continue to increase. Now x's start decreasing. So it's now square root three. Then I'll have a square root two divided by a square root two. A square root three divided by a square root one. And finally, a square root of four divided by a square root of zero. There's our special right triangle values. That means our hand trick values. That's all of them for tangent. Now with tangent, everything reduces. So what is the negative square root of four divided by a square root of zero gonna be? Undefined. Are you allowed to divide by zero? No. So don't do an equal sign because technically it's not equal. We're gonna say this is undefined. It's not equal to, uh, you can't be equal to undefined. So technically you shouldn't write that. You'll learn that in the AP calculus. But I'm gonna go ahead and just start teaching that. You just write that's undefined. Okay, what about negative square root of three divided by a square root of one? What can that reduce to be? Negative square root of three, good. What about negative square root of two divided by square root of two? Negative one. What about negative square root one over square root three? This one's tricky. I'll write it up here. Negative square root one over square root three. Can I leave a square root in the denominator? So you, what you do is you multiply by a funny looking one. You multiply by the square root of three over the square root of three. What does that equal? This is multiply, not negative. That would equal a negative square root of three divided by the square root of nine. What is the square root of nine? Negative square root of three divided by Three. That's what this value is. Negative square root three divided by three. What's the square root of zero divided by square root four? Zero, good. Okay, what about square root one over square root three? Square root three over three. Square root two divided by square root two? One. Square root three divided by square root one. And finally, square root of four divided by square root zero. Again, undefined. So that will be outside, that value will be outside the restricted range for the inverse. All right, third time's the charm. DOL number three. Same concept as earlier. I want you to use that table to find each of these inverse values. Use your table to find the inverse values, DOL number three. All right, so now that we've gone through this introduction, let's now use the calculator to find some values. So uh, what we're gonna do is first, we'll find the calculator to identify the value within three decimal places. And then I gotta show you, because here's how you're gonna be given it in the real world, frankly. 
because you're not going to be shown the inverse sign. So the inverse is going to be used to solve, but then we're going to have to find the other answers. So that's what I'm going to walk you through here. We're going to be looking on the interval from zero to two pi. Okay, that's step two. So first, how would I do this? Well, if you were in an algebra class and you were doing algebra, the question that you would ask yourself is how do I isolate my variable? What is my variable here on part, example four, part A? What is my variable? Theta. We need to isolate the theta. That theta is inside of a sine right now. It's inside of a sine function. So how can I get it outside of a sine function? Meaning what's the opposite of a sine? We're gonna do a sine inverse. So I wanna do a sine inverse of one fourth. That's gonna equal theta. That's what an inverse does, is an inverse changes your input and output. When I do the inverse, it isolates that theta. When I do an inverse here, it will isolate that theta. So open up your calculators. Oh, open up this calculator. What's going on with my calculator? There we go, that's what I wanted. I wanna do mine like this and I'm gonna switch my board over so I can see both. Open up your calculator, go to new document. Uh, make sure your calculator is in radian mode. If you're not in radian, you can just, you'll use this. You can highlight rad, radians and click it once you move around your little mouse, highlight it. If you're in degrees, just click it so to go to radians or you can press home screen to menu C and choose okay. When, if you do that, it'll also put it in radians. So make sure you're in radians. Let's type this in. Where do we find sine inverse? Press the trig button and you'll see it right there. Sine inverse of one fourth. This says round to three decimal places. So when I round this, will I say it, the answer is 0.252 or will it need to become 0.253? Kevin, you'll be doing this with me. What are we getting here? 0.253, we're gonna use 0.253. So coming back over here, we're gonna say theta equals point, let me do a zero, so 0 0.253. Now here's the deal, that's one answer. There's going to be two answers if it's not an inverse. You can say that again. If it's a regular sign, is a regular sign restricted? No. So I, there's another answer I have to find. I want you to think of a unit circle here. So here's the X, here's the Y. Y values, where are Y's positive? Up, down, left, or right? Uh, we have two answers. The calculator just gave us this one. That right there is 0 0.253. That produced a Y value of 1 fourth. Like if you took it to the y axis, that would be the value one fourth. That's what we just found. But there's another value that would produce the same thing. It's this one over here in this quadrant. This answer would have the same angle. These two would be the one and the same. It would be the same angle, but this is coming from pi. So to get your second answer, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our pi, so put, type in pi, and I want you, want you to subtract that answer. We're gonna subtract 0 0.253. And you know what? To get a more exact answer, let's just copy and paste it. Let's do that. Copy and paste it like that, and then we'll round again. Press enter. What do we get this time? 0 0.2888 or 2889? 0 0.2889. That's gonna be our second answer. So our first answer and our second answer is 0 0.2889. Now, if you're wondering one more time, how do we get a second answer? That's because this is not an inverse. So we needed two answers and both of them are coming from, to have the height of one fourth, they have to have the same angle coming from an X axis. The first quadrant comes from the value of zero. This value came from a pi. Because I was going like a clock here, I subtracted it from pi, that would be its value. Okay, so those are my two angles. One more time, 
that distance in here, this amount of curvature would be 0.253. But if I tracked it all the way around from over here, it would be 0.2889. That's where that came from. That from here to here is 2889. That would be that second answer. Okay, let's do part B. All right, I want to isolate the theta. What do I do to get this theta by itself? We're going to do an inverse here. So we're going to do an inverse to switch these two. So if I did a cosine inverse of negative 3 fifths, that will give me the value of theta. So let's go to our calculators. We'll type this in. So cosine inverse. Whoops. Cosine inverse of negative three fifths. That's providing me my first answer. What are y'all getting as you look at your calculator? Are you getting 2.214? Is that what you're getting? Perfect. Okay, let's think through a unit circle here. Two point two one four. That's in the second quadrant. There's multiple ways I know it's in the second quadrant. One is I know it's not past the second quadrant because the second quadrant becomes the third quadrant at pi, which is three point fourteen. Okay, if I put these on there, so I know that half of three point fourteen is approximately one point five seven. I know it's more than that. So that's one reason I know it's in the second quadrant. It's more than pi over two, but it's less than one whole pi. But the easiest way is this: I have a cosine that is Positive or negative? Negative. That means I have to have a negative x. And when I type in the inverse, the calculator will never give me a cosine down here. So it only gives me the value up here. So draw a line over here. And this theta from there to there is that 2.214. This produced the answer here, this x value of negative three fifths. Now there's another place we can get a negative three fifths. Which quadrant would also produce the same negative x? Quadrant three. Well, does quadrant four have a positive or negative x? Positive. What about quadrant one, positive or negative x? Positive. positive. Those two are positive, but we also have a negative x this way. And so what you would do is you'd have this same value, but to get to the third quadrant, since this, this is the amount of distance it covers to get from to this line here, I would do the same thing, but I'm going this way, which means I'm going to take away, because I'm now going like a clock, I'm going to take away from 2 pi. So go to your calculator, type in 2 pi, and then subtract the answer we just got and press enter. Now these are our two answers for this particular problem. I'm going to go ahead and just snap those in for later on. Those would be the two answers for our first two problems. So uh, I have 2.214. How did I get this other one? Is I subtracted 2 pi minus 2.214. And we got how much? 4.069. That's our an other answer. OK, and I'm going to just add in, so in case you look back at the notes later, this value from, whoops. To get that value, we just took pi. That was pi minus. That one right there was pi minus uh, the 2.53. Pi minus the 0 0.253. That's how I got that one. Okay, let's try it one more time with tangent. All right, walk me through. How would I isolate my variable here? Inverse. We do an inverse. So I'm going to have 
theta equals tangent inverse of negative 4.5. Let's go to our calculators and see what we get. So tangent inverse of negative 4.5. Now, what are you getting for your theta? Negative 1.352. Negative 1.35. Do you all agree with the rounding too? Okay. Now, that's not an acceptable answer. All of these so far I've given you are acceptable answers. What's wrong with this answer? Look at number two. It's Where is our answer supposed to be between? Zero. zero and two pi. Is this in between zero and two pi? No. So what I would need to do on this one, uh, let me shrink this a little bit more so I have room, is I'm going to do a quick drawing, and you'll figure out where this value would be. On a unit circle here, if you had negative angle, what that means is I'm going like a clock. And so a negative would be starting from 0 and moving downward, typically. But when I redraw this, if it's negative, and that's not even a negative whole pi, it's going to be somewhere down here, like this. That's where tangent's negative. So this right there is negative 1.352. That's what I just did. For the answer that we need, though, I'm subtracting from how much? 2 pi. So what we're going to type in the calculator is 2 pi minus 1.352. So take 2 pi, 2 pi, and take away the, the answer we just got. Actually, it's negative, so i got to be careful copying that like that. Um, I'm going to make this a minus. There we go. So it's 2 pi minus 1.352. Press Enter. What do you get? Are you getting 4 point? Okay, if you copy and paste, be careful, because our calculator will treat a negative as a multiplying. Uh, if you copy and paste, make sure you change the negative to a subtraction. The calculator will do a funky thing if you don't. So if you're not getting 4.93. Okay, now where does the other answer come from? Well, tangent, remember, tangent's not y, tangent's not x. Tangent is y over x, which means it's like slope. Tangent's other answer will be a straight line going the other way, this, this direction. Which means we're going to have the same angle, but this time coming from this x-axis. The angle always will come from the x-axis. So if this one came from here, this angle, it's going to be the same amount of angle, but it's coming from here. This time, I'm going to type in pi minus that 1.352. So basically, we can copy and paste what I just typed in, but I'm going to delete the 2 at the front. Press Enter on that. Are you getting 1.789? Mm -hmm. That's our other answer. So these would be our two answers here, two sets of answers. Uh, so for to put them in order from least to greatest, the first answer would be 1.789. And the other answer is 4.93. Now, I had to edit both of these because they weren't within the interval. Now, I want to tell you right now, good news for you on this. So when you head to delta math, they use degrees. Degrees are easier to work with than radians. Degrees are a whole lot easier to work with than radians on this. All right. So DOL number four. I want you to find all values of theta that cosine theta equals three over four on zero to two pi. Okay, so I want you to go through your steps. Try to find where does cosine theta equal 3 over 4. All right, now let's take a look. On this slide here, this slide, what it's all about is it's telling you that a sine, and when we think about an inverse, the inverse of anything, we think about it as being its opposite, the way to undo something. And that is true. But with sine and cosine, and tangent, 
they might not be totally opposites of one another. What do I mean? If you have a sine of a sine inverse, it will only equal itself if your original input is between negative one and one. Now, why does that have to be the case? Because with sine inverse, what does your in input have to be between? X. If it's a sine inverse. Do you remember what the domain was for sine inverse? Oh, that was uh, that became its range. The input was not the negative pi over two to pi, pi over two. The input was negative one to one. So if you're outside of this, this interval, it would not exist. And therefore you could not find, they couldn't cancel each other out. And so this is only true if you're in between negative one and one. That's what am I trying to say? They are only opposites, a sine of a sine inverse, if you're in the interval negative one to one, because that's the only time the inverse would exist. Same with cosine, but tangent's different because you remember tangent's in, uh, inverse is all reals. And so it could, it'll always exist taking a tangent of a tangent inverse. They're always opposites. However, if you switch up the order, if you started with the sine, the domain is now all reals, but the output is not. And therefore we had to restrict that range. And so the values are only, they're only opposites on this interval. All that to say, is inverses that aren't quite as easy with trig. So let me show you that. We're gonna finish up looking at a few problems here. Example five, let's take a look. So here's how we're gonna do this. We're just gonna work a step at a time following PIMDOS. We're gonna follow PIMDOS and just see what we end up with. Sometimes, well, what our answer will look like is that they go cancel, cancel, the answer is two pi over three. Oftentimes with trig, it doesn't work that way. So hand trick here. With sine, and I'm going to do one in, uh, unit circle for us for all these problems, just to help us out. 2 pi over 3, what quadrant is that in? Second quadrant. It's not one, quite one whole pi. It's more than half of a pi, but it's not, not one whole pi. It's in the second quadrant. That's going to matter in a second. Okay, hand trick. But we're going to simplify these one thing at a time. We're going to start with PEMDAS, which means start with inside that parentheses. Sine 2 pi over 3. Which finger do you bend? Yeah. Bend your index. Flip your hand over. What do you get for sine? Square root 3 over. Question for you. Look at the unit circle. Would this be positive or negative if we're talking about sine? Sine is what variable? Y. This should be positive. Great. So leave it there. Now we're going to do the sine inverse of this. Okay, so now we're doing the sine inverse. So we start with the back side of our hand. You need to find square root three of fingers. Do you have three Y's? What finger is bent right now? Index. Flip your hand over. What pi does that come from? Pi over three. Because uh, sine inverse, it will not, sign inverse will not use that side of the graph. Guess what the answer is going to be? Hmm. Pi over three. Because the inverse will not go back to the second quadrant. These are not a direct cancel, cancel. Did our answer just cancel out? No, this equaled pi over three. Okay, let's go to the next one. It says cosine of cosine inverse. 3 pi over 4. Okay, cosine inverse. Which side of the hand do you look at? Back. Back side. What's your 3 pi over 4 finger? Middle. It would be middle if we were looking at our pi side of the hand. Are we looking at the pi side of the hand? No, this is outside the restricted domain. This is outside the domain. So if this is outside, let me go here. This right here is outside the restricted domain. So what does that mean about our value? Does not exist. This does not exist. Inverse for cosine sine has to be between negative one and one. If you type that in the calculator, you'll see that three pi over four is not in between those two values. Three pi over four is not in between negative, including negative one and one. See, it's too big. Does not exist outside the restricted domain. Okay, how about tangent inverse of tangent five pi over six? Okay, 
So it's a regular tangent. Which side of the hand are you looking at? Back. Nope. Regular tangent, we look at the palm. Take your palm in your hand. That's your pi side. We want five pi over six. By the way, five pi over six is over here. Five pi over six is over here. Okay. Which finger are you bending? Not uh, our ring finger. Ring. You agree? Yeah. I agree with that. Ring and a ring finger. Flip your hand over. What do you get for tangent on that? One over two. Square root one divided by square root three. And I'm not going to reduce this right now. I'm going to leave it like that. Is this positive or negative for tangent if you're over there? I have a positive Y, but a <coughs> negative X. So guess what? This is going to be negative. I'm not going to simplify it. I'm going to leave it like that. Now we'll do tangent inverse. So if I'm doing a tangent inverse, I'm now looking at the back of my hand. So at the back of your hand, looking at the back of your hand, I need one Y and three X fingers. So which finger do I bend? Mm -hmm. Still the ring finger. Flip your hand over. What place gives you that? Pi over six. But for tangent, it's inverse is restricted. Tangent only gives answer from here and here. So guess what the answer is now going to be? Negative pi over six. That's our answer now. So notice that my answer value did not, it did not just cancel, cancel. You can't just say they're opposites, cancel each other. It shifted it into the restricted domain. Okay, your DOL. Try this one. And by the way, if you get lost, you can type these in the calculator. But for now, you can try your hand trick, go step by step, and what you think. All right, let's pick up and look at example six now. Example six says, evaluate each of the following expressions. This is more or less what I would expect you to get on the AP exam. Again, I don't write the AP exam. There's never been one given. I'm guessing you'll see it more this way because this requires a little bit more expertise to solve. So let's start with the inside here. Uh, I want to do sine inverse of negative one half. That means what angle would give me a negative one half on the sine value. Now, sine is what letter? Y. Y. Now, remember, for inverse, you're not going to look at the whole unit circle. But if I need a y value of negative one half, I'm looking down here. That's negative one half. Normally, we would think there would be two answers. But if it's inverse, it only produces one answer. It's going to be this answer over here. Whoops. When I wasn't thinking what I was doing there. It's going to be this answer that goes out right there. So I want you, using a hand trick, sign inverse. Do I look at the palm of my hand or the back of my hand? Go to the back of your hand. What gives me square root one finger or Y? Which one should we bend? That one Y. Ring finger. Bend your ring finger. What produces a ring finger? What is that? What pi now when you flip your hand over? It's a pi over six. Whoops. It's a pi over six. Now, if I'm in the fourth quadrant, it's not a positive pi over six. This is a... Negative pi over six. Now, what do I do with that? I take a cosine of it. So now, take your finger, that negative pi over six, bend it, flip it. What's your cosine there? It's square root three over two. Look over here. Would this be a positive or a negative? It's a positive. Why is it positive? Because cosine is what variable? x and we're on the right side so it's a positive square root of three over two you know what i'll do another one this one rather than drawing a unit circle you know i do like on our regular pre-calc where we deal with triangles i'm going to draw this as a triangle to help you out maybe this will help you looking at it as a triangle if you draw a triangle make it as a right triangle always put your theta and your right angle on the x-axis Okay, this says cosine inverse is 5 over 13. That's not on our hand trick, but it is an acceptable value. That's why I'm going to draw a triangle. We can't do this by fingers, but it's between negative 1 and 1, so I can do this. What is cosine's ratio? X over R. So X is 5. R happens to be the same thing as your hypotenuse, which is 13. So what I could do here is a Pythagorean theorem. 
And what we'd get is five squared plus y squared equals 13 squared. I'm gonna do your math quickly for you. What's five squared? Plus y squared equals, that's 169. When I subtract 25, I have y squared equals 144. And what is the square root of 144? 12. 12. Yes. Okay, so since our y value is 12, go ahead right here. What I now do is this value here, it would be some angle, which we could type in the calculator. Honestly, you could type the whole thing in the calculator, and I'll get to that in a moment. You could type this in to get the exact value, but basically we don't care about what that angle is. That is 1.176 radians, which if you were doing this as a triangle, you'd switch over to degrees, and you could state for the triangle in degrees, that would be 67.38 degrees. That's what would go there. And then you'd say, okay, well, I need to now plug that into sine. And so ultimately, the answer we're going to get is sine of cosine inverse of 5 over 13. And at this stage, it doesn't matter what mode you're in because it's going to give you the answer as sine's ratio. So I'll switch back, press enter. It's going to say it's 0.923. Well, you're looking at it going, well, it doesn't say what, what's around. That's because this actual answer here, when I simplify this, this is some theta here, which I'm just going to call, uh, I'll just leave it as theta. That I'm going to say is equal to theta. And so now what I'm doing is sine of theta. And so what is sine of theta equal? Well, sine is y over h. So it's this y divided by h. It is 12 divided by 13. Now you might be looking at the calculator going, that doesn't look like it's 12 divided by 13. Well, let me press menu 2, 2. Menu 2, 2. I hit enter. And you can see that it is 12 over 13. So that is, in fact, how you can do that problem. And using a calculator in the process, that's uh, how you would uh, figure all that out. OK, so let's now look at part C. It says if x is between 0 and 1, uh, greater than 0 but less than or equal to 1, evaluate sine cosine inverse of x as an algebraic expression in terms of x. So in terms of a unit circle, again, if we were going to do unit circle, what this means is I would have a restricted left side of the graph because my x, uh, my x values, which is this cosine inverse, is telling you about the x values themselves, not the angle. It, this x would refer to the side lengths. It has to be between 0 and 1. So we're somewhere off to the right. I have to have a positive x. So I'm over here somewhere. And whatever we get, we want to know this, the sign of it. Now, if you're dealing with a cosine inverse, remember, that has a restriction where you only look from 0 to 1 pi. So this, this part is where we look for answers. This is restricted. Whoops. Restricted. Here we go. Restricted for y equals cosine inverse of x. So we're not going to look at those values down there. That all that part of the graph gets restricted. So we're not even interested with the values down here. We're only uh, up here. And because my x has to be between 0 and 1, this is a value of 0. If I drew a circle here, let me go ahead and add in a circle. This would be a value of 0. That right there is an x value of 1. So I have to be somewhere over here. So because of this here, that part's gone. We're not going to look use it that part of the graph because x has to be positive. Over there, x is less than 0. And so we're only looking over here. That means we have to have a first quadrant answer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw just any random triangle or angle going through there. Now I'm going to blow that up. So what I'm going to look at here is a triangle. And the way this triangle would work is if you go down like this and like that. OK, so that's what I'm doing here. Just so you can see, it. I'm drawing a triangle. And again, this is a right triangle. So I'll put my right angle there. This will be my theta. And it says it's cosine x. Well, cosine is the ratio of x over r. That's normally what it is. Well, in this case, there's no denominator. And so I want to make it over 1. So my radius here is going to be 1. That's my radius. That means this is x. Now, the unknown value is our y. We don't know what y is. 
And if I want to solve it in terms of an algebraic expression, I would do Pythagorean again, x squared plus y squared equals one. And I want to solve for the x. We're going to leave this in terms of x. That means don't worry about the x, solve for the y. So what I would do, oops, I forgot to put the one squared. That's my Pythagorean theorem. x squared plus y squared equals, you could do r squared, but here I'll just put the one, or there I had it as an h. And now I can just go to solve. You get y isolated, I would subtract the x squared. One squared is one. I'm gonna subtract the squared. And now I'll take the square root. So y would equal the square root. Now, because we have to be first quadrant because of all these different restrictions, I have to have a positive square root of one minus x squared. That's my y. y would equal square root of one minus x squared. Okay, so if you're following it all, what does that mean for my answer? This right here produces the angle theta. That right there produces that angle theta. And then I would do the sine of that angle. The sine of that angle would be y over h. It's this divided by one. So if you take your y and divide it by your hypotenuse or your rate radius, however you wanna think of it, it's gonna be the square root of one minus x squared all divided by one, which is just simply the square root of one minus x squared. That's my answer here. Now, I wish I could just type this in the calculator to show you, but that is in fact the answer. Okay, so you know one thing I could show you is if we just picked random numbers, I could prove to you that uh, this is a true statement. Let me go ahead and in case I need a picture of this later, let me take one now. Tools, capture page. What I'm gonna do is just plug in a couple numbers just to try it out. So I want sine cosine. Oh, how about this one? That's a value between zero and one. And if you press enter, we get that value. Okay, so what that's saying is no matter what the x is, this should also be an answer. If I did the square root, whoops, the square root of one minus, and in this case, the five over 13 represented the x. Five over 13. And I press enter. Notice, oh, I forgot to square it. That's not the same. Let me square it. This needs to be squared because it was x squared. All right, squared. All right, now let's see. What do we get? Look over there. We get the same exact answer. Remember, this answer to that was 12 over 13. I'm getting the same answer here. Let's do it again. I want to pick a different number between 0 and 1. So how about 0. 0.5? If I did sine, uh, trig, oh, sorry. If I did sine of cosine inverse, and this time I chose a different number between zero and one. Let's do 0. 0.5 and I press enter. There's my answer. Now, if I did the same thing again as here, if I type in the square root of one minus, and in this case, I've changed X to be 0. 0.5, 0. 0.5 squared, I hit enter. Notice I still get the same answer. They're equal to one another. So we did do it correctly. This does represent this value here. But whatever you plug in X, as long as X is between zero and one, if you type in that same X value here, you should get the exact same answer. So after going through all of that, how about you take a look at DOL number six?